This morning, if you would uh, join with me in Colossians chapter 1. Starting in verse 24, I will read through the end of the chapter. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been made manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Father, I thank you for this passage this morning. I ask that you would speak through it. You would explain the things that are confusing and teach us that we might be complete in you also. In Jesus' name, amen. Presenting everyone mature in Christ is the culmination of Paul's first chapter here. Having previously established for his readers, the Christians in Colossae, that Jesus Christ is the first, the last, the creator and sustainer of all things, and is, we found, the very image or the complete representation of God, Paul now gets to explaining what his purpose and hope is for those who would listen to his exhortation. He's getting to the point of his letter. I asked last week if anyone could find the obscure and slightly contentious verse where Paul talks about baptism for the dead. Did anybody look it up? I have one person. That's excellent. Do you know where it's located? Did I find it again? Okay, it's in 1 Corinthians 15.29. Go ahead and read it for us. Okay, we're finding it. That's okay. You can all look there too. 1 Corinthians 15.29. But since you found it, you have the honor of reading it. Fifteen twenty nine. Now, what shall they do who shall baptize the dead? If the dead are not at all, why are then they why then why they then baptize the dead? Okay, thank you. So we have one star student today. 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty nine, Paul says, in fact, to the Christians in Corinth. For otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Yanked out of its context, cut out of Paul's entire teaching, we have no real idea what this verse means. Do we? And this is why certain groups do get baptized for those who have already died. Because they didn't look at the whole context. They didn't understand what was being said. And for those who are willing to study this verse over the next week, you should write it down. I will offer a written explanation in next week's bulletin of this one verse. You see, Bible reading and study does require that we use the minds God has given us. And it is during our deliberate studying that the Holy Spirit operates to give us his insights and clarity but we have to also be studying. Well, this morning, Paul makes another... See, now you have to wait. (laughs) Sorry, I'm not going to tell you what it means today. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, this, this is how you ensure people come back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29. I promise it will be in the bulletin, and then we can have great discussion. So Paul makes another statement this morning in our text that has occasioned some head-scratching and sadly the opportunity for false doctrine by certain groups who've tried to make sense of verse 24 in isolation from the rest of the text. So verse 24 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. I would encourage you this morning to always pay attention to sentence structure and grammar. Find out what is the subject and what are details to the subject when you read a sentence like this. I spent some time and I perused, again, I'm not picking on particular groups, but I perused some Catholic websites on this verse to see what they said. And here are some of the things I found. I will quote, they said, This indicates that Jesus left some things undone, not in himself, but in each of us. Sounds like self-help is the next option there. But what is the point of the verse? Another Catholic suggestion was that God invites us to participate in the salvific action of Jesus through our own suffering. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul suggesting that? No. Another website, which was not Catholic, suggested Christ is still suffering now because there is so much sin in the world. We can help stop the suffering in the world and Christ's suffering if we are willing to suffer as he did. We can cover the sin consequences that are lacking, uh, lacking being covered up by Christ's sacrifice if we are willing to absorb them in our own flesh and pay the price for them. Right. You see what happens when you yank a verse out of its context they, this group created a doctrine where Jesus, God the Eternal Son, sitting at the right hand of the Father, is currently suffering. Apparently. How convenient this system that the guilt we feel for his suffering, suffering we can remedy in our own suffering. This is not the doctrine of the Bible. Here's another interpretation of this verse, this time from a very well-known I will not give you his name, Reformed Pastor, who says that there are people all over the world who have never seen the afflictions of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I'm going to fill that lack by making a presentation of my own suffering. My suffering will become the visible visible reenactment of the suffering of Christ. Is that what Paul was saying? So, This is just to help you realize we need to study carefully. Is it possible in verse 24 that God hurried his calculations and somehow missed a few important details about Jesus' life and work on the cross? Is it possible? Is it possible that the Romans neglected to squeeze out the last salvific drop of blood? And Paul needed to supplement with his own blood, sweat, and tears? Can you imagine Paul suggesting such a thing of himself? I hope you can't. After hanging on the cross, Jesus said, John 19.30, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. His work of atonement was accomplished and complete. We also learn in Hebrews 9.28 that Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Once. This is a one-time event. But even if Paul knows full well that Christ's work is fully accomplished... But since God has not forced us to compliance, 
Paul then can state rightly in Romans 10, verse 13, that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Paul understood the whole picture. Paul wasn't confused. And some might say, well, wait a minute. That means there's still something for Paul and the rest of us to do. Jesus' suffering was a sacrifice for sin. Paul's suffering was suffer service for the church. They are not the same thing. Not at all. Two different things. Jesus did take on a human body and nature and the sin of the world upon the cross. He created the plan of salvation and redemption, and he alone completed the plan. Not Paul, not any human. None of us can suffer enough to create this, whatever this mystical union is, with the still suffering Christ. No human or angel can join Christ as some co-participant in his redemptive work. That would be false doctrine. For those of us that were here uh, several months ago and we studied the book of Acts, we saw through the book of Acts the many, many very real hardships that Paul and the other apostles, the other missionaries, faced when they presented the Bible. Many, many hardships. But Jesus had already predicted these trials. In fact, he stated in John 15, 20, Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his Master, if they persecuted me, says Jesus, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. All of us who serve Christ in obedience to Scripture, whether it's in teaching, in presenting the gospel, all of us who labor to make God and Scripture known, can expect true labor. Real labor. Even the aged Apostle John joined the ranks with all those who toiled by saying in Revelations 1.9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. John is a Christian brother to all who suffer and endure for Christ. That means you and I. We're, we are part of this. And this is why he was exiled to the island of Patmos, because he labored in presenting Christ. We also know that Paul was likely writing this letter from a Roman prison, so he knew what it meant to labor for Christ. But notice Paul does not make an association with Christ's physical body, but with the church. Paul wasn't saying, look, I'm part of the physical sufferings of Christ. No, Paul suffered for the church, which was Christ's body. And Paul, as we know, even rejoiced, it says, that he could serve Christ, and then he would see unbelievers come to Christ. He would see Christians growing in their faith. And their understanding, this is where he got joy, even though it was, in fact, labor. Well, that's all of verse 24. We have to look carefully when you read a verse. The sufferings are for the church. Verse 25, he goes on, of this church, <laughs> I was made a minister, according to the stewardship from God, bestowed on me for your benefit. So that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. Paul already said previously that he was called by God as an apostle. Commissioned by God as an apostle, right? This is a witness, a, um, an ambassador. But here in this verse, he shows a true humility. Because the word minister in this verse is diakonos, a deacon. Paul, the great apostle, says, but for you, 
I am a deacon. Well, what does this mean? Deacon in the Greek, it's actually, I like the the description. It refers to a servant who works with speed and intensity such that they kick up dust. How about that? Who's ready for that? So maybe all the 20-year-olds. No. (laughs) That's a deacon. He's working on their benefit. Paul will use whatever position and opportunity he can to promote Christ and Christian living in the church. That's what he'll do. And I'm here to say that each of you this morning has a voice and a sphere of influence also. Each person can choose to make time to promote the things of God. That's all of you here this morning. You can choose to pray with others, to study with others. To listen to others. You can listen to the cries of people's hearts. Each of us can switch titles and roles as the Holy Spirit directs. Paul was willing, as we know, to be beat up, to be imprisoned. Certainly you and I can humbly follow the Lord's teaching and guidance in our lives. If we take 26 and 27 together... That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but it now has been manifested to his saints. Well, you can read 27. This is another one of these verses that taken all by itself causes some confusion. Which is why I prefer when I study and preach to go through an entire passage so that we don't just take one little piece out and do something with it that may have nothing to do with the original intent. That's one benefit of actually just going through verse by verse. So when you look at verses 26 and 27, your eye should catch the fact that Paul uses the word mystery twice in these two verses. Mystery. You see, at that time, just like we find today, various cults and groups, in order to keep control over their members, used secret Knowledge, secret rituals, mystery. And the addition of mystery would keep their members under tension to create a sense of wonder and fear. There's just something secret that's unknown except to certain people. You see what that creates? Special knowledge reserved for those who work harder, who pay more dues, who've worked through more steps, they have special knowledge. And of course, we're going to find out with Paul that these immature Christians in Colossae were falling prey to these mystery cults. So, but when Paul uses the word, the Greek allowed for it to mean not something unknown, not something obscured and riddled or mystique. You see that today, that's the only way we understand mystery. But in the, in the older Greek, it's not that. Paul proposed the opposite about Christ in Scripture in these verses. Paul preached about God's plan unfolding, meaning there was something there that was being brought forth a step at a time. God's will and counsel are not the same as mystery in the way that we would use the word. They are already in place. They are already unfolding. God already knows the beginning from the end of his own plans and will. There's no mystery to God. And if you recall, the prophet Daniel was given an insight by God about King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Right? So you have to go back to Daniel chapter 2, starting in verse 20. Daniel then thanks God for his insights by saying, May the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. It is he who changes the times and the periods. He removes kings and appoints kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to people of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells in him. 
Then, in verse 44 of Daniel, he explains the fate of human history to Nebuchadnezzar. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Just as you saw that a stone was broken off from the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is certain, and its interpretation is trustworthy. God's plans are not completely known to us, but they are completely known to himself. There's no mystery there. And God is not the obscure leader of a mystery cult. God has a complete and perfect plan for this creation. From before anything was created, we discussed this in Sunday school, none of this was an afterthought. This was all part of the one thought. There's no hidden knowledge that we can somehow attain to. And I like to remind us in the Garden of Eden, and that would be Genesis chapter 3, in the Garden of Eden, when God punished Satan, the serpent, right, and humanity for their disobedience, for sin, he said in 3.14, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. What that meant was revealed by God according to his timing in human history. It wasn't clearly understood then. God revealed that in time, and Jesus Christ is the one who delivered that fatal crushing blow to Satan and his power. That's the full fulfillment of that. It did come from the woman, like he said. Well, in verse 27, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glories of mystery among the Gentiles, which is in Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul sets out into the open now this uh, anti-mystery. <laughs> Jesus Christ and his salvation have been offered to the Gentiles. That is the, there's no mystery. That's what he's trying to say. Stop listening to the mysteries. This is what it is. It's out in the open. God had not divulged his entire plan in the Old Testament, although if you look, you will find parts of it there where God will save and bring people to himself, it says, who are not of the Israelites. But the prophets of old didn't understand all of it. It wasn't given to them as it was to the apostles in the New Testament. You see, in Christ, there's no secret club. <laughs> there's no secret knowledge or handshakes to get in the church here unless you guys created some that I don't know about. I'm pretty sure we all walked in the door. God's love and sacrifice are equally offered to all people. And that is what Paul is telling them. Don't let people lead you astray. God's love and his offer to reconnect are inclusive for all mankind. Well, then he gets to 28 and 29, which, as you know, is all we're going to cover today. He says, we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with wisdom so that. Now, see, this is how you have to read the sentence. We proclaim, we do these things, we do so that. That's the end of his point. We do these things so that we may present every man or woman complete in Christ. That is his point. Paul identifies with all of God's workers and explains what his motivation is. To, he says, to proclaim Christ, it doesn't mean just preach. It just means to proclaim, to tell others. Proclaim Christ, to admonish and to teach. To all people, not the select secret group. Paul, along with Epaphras, we saw in the beginning, 
And all those who faithfully serve God happily proclaim the truth of Christ wherever he can. And he would say this is the true wisdom as opposed to, and again, this is the next chapter, as opposed to this Greek philosophy and these other wisdoms of mankind, this is the true wisdom that comes from Scripture. You will get this true wisdom from the Holy Spirit. You will get it from studying. You will get it from listening. And Paul will present the person and the work of Christ. That's what he always does. The person and the work. He also says he's going to admonish. What does admonishing mean? To give warnings. It's admonishment. To warn people of what is right and what is wrong. He's going to do that to believers and unbelievers alike. And notice there's this idea of being able and willing to teach another. We know from Scripture that's the mark of spiritual maturity. You should be studying so that you can tell others. And if you love people like you love Christ and you're concerned about their well-being here and later, then you should be willing to talk to them. It doesn't mean you have to be a teacher, but you should be willing to talk to them. Well, All this hard work, all this real labor that Paul talks about didn't dissuade him from his calling. Paul's aim is to bring people to Christ, to help them mature into godly followers of Christ. You may think, well, that's all fine for those super apostles. But God didn't give me the power, didn't give me any charm, anything special. Well, before you try to offload your Christian responsibilities upon somebody else sitting beside you, look at what Paul says. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to his power. Oh, wait a minute. His, the Holy Spirit's power, which works mightily within me. Oh, see, it isn't all about my, my abilities and my mindset. It's actually about God working inside. And Paul would say a very similar thing to the Corinthian church in Corinthians 15.10. Apparently, he had the same message for all the churches. He says in 1510, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. But I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and you believed. Do you see that heart now? laboring, but not just laboring because he has the power of God to help him labor. And it didn't matter that others were laboring. He was going to labor. What was the point? Why is he doing it? To present believers complete in Christ. You see, God made you right here this morning. God made you with abilities, disabilities. God knows your life experiences. He gave you skills. He has given you spiritual giftings if you are a believer. And more importantly, the Holy Spirit, as a believer, is living within you the same way as in the Apostle Paul. It's the same Holy Spirit. The same power is living. Have you thought about that recently? The same Holy Spirit is within you that was in the Apostles. I guess the difference is For some of us, we're very busy with life, apparently. I wonder if anyone this morning is asking God to mature them and give them a heart to labor for his kingdom. Is anybody asking that of God this morning? I'm going to put up a couple slides very quickly, or somebody's going to put them up for me. Many people are 
familiar with the Romanian pastor and wife, in this case, Richard Wormbrandt. His wife was Sabina, who wrote the book Tortured for Christ. As a Christian pastor under communism, he endured 14 brutal years in prison. And he wrote, amongst other things, I have seen Christians in communist prisons with 50 pounds of chains on their feet, tortured with red hot irons, in whose throat spoonfuls of salt have been forced, being kept afterwards from water, starving, whipped, suffering from cold, and praying with fervor for the communists. Thanks to him, an organization called Voice of the Martyrs was birthed and went on and continues to help persecuted Christians. Another Romanian preacher, which my wife, I was curious if she knew about him, uh, say, no, his name is Joseph Tsof with a T. <laughs> He sent a letter of biblical standards to the dictator Ceausescu, if you can imagine. <laughs> this is what the Bible says about leadership, is what he did. He was immediately arrested and interrogated and threatened with de death daily for six months. That was his life because he chose to promote the standards of God. Finally, fearing that his gospel message would become more popular if they killed him, they exiled Joseph in 1981. Well, thanks to him, many faithful Christians throughout the centuries have understood that the world still needs us to labor for the sake of the church in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not called simply to sit in pews to keep them warm. What he ended up doing, which is still alive today, is he became the pastoral voice for Radio Free Europe. And if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. But basically, during the Cold War, under communist rule, this was the free underground radio from which they got real news and real encouragement. And he became a pastor on that. That's labor. Real labor. You see, even these Romanian pastors who labored like Paul were fond of quoting the Lord's words from Luke 21, 12, where Jesus predicted, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison, and you'll be brought before kings and governors all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. That's the labor it's a, it's a wonderful thing that Paul is putting in here. He's not saying this so that we feel sorry for him. He's saying this because he had a deep love and calling for the church, for God's people. So some of us here today need to allow, I think, the Holy Spirit to reshape us from the inside out. I think. We need new priorities we need a life that's aligned with Scripture and cut off from the sin that so easily entangles us. Some of us need to grow in our knowledge of the Bible. Some of us need to grow in our prayer. Some of us need to trust in God's love and plan for our lives. And some here need to refocus our time and energy into serving Christ whether in the church or other places. These are not isolated men like Paul. This is all Christians at all times. If Christ's suffering was for redemption, then the suffering and labors of Christians are for his church. To preach, to teach, to promote, to discuss and encourage the gospel in all of scripture, for all people. So here's my question. Because you see, every day with God is a new day of resolutions, right? Are you ready to labor in love for the Lord 
and allow his power to fulfill his perfect plan? Then I wonder then if those who follow us will be able to say, like Paul in 1 Thessalonians, we remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.